welcome to the New Testament Review. Where occasionally we discuss articles that will be influential <laughs> later. <laughs> I'm Ian Mills. I'm Laura Robinson. And we are both PhD candidates at Duke University. So uh, the reason why our intro sounds a little different today is those of you who are regular listeners know that we like to discuss classic pieces of New Testament scholarship that have been influential and have been responded to in the field. But sometimes we like to talk about an article that's been published in 2019. And we like to do that when it's been written by a host. Exactly. So. <laughs> this article is none of those things. This is not influential. It's not written by a famous scholar. Instead, it's written, it's written by Ian. <laughs> by me. Congratulations, um, Ian. So today we're going to talk about pagan readers of Christian scripture, the role of books in early autobiographical conversion narratives, which is published in Virgilla Christiani, 2019, just now. You can go read this yourself. Ian, what's this article about? (laughs) (laughs) So I'm arguing that um, against a current consensus or an overwhelming majority of scholarship on the audience of Christian literature, I'm arguing there is in fact evidence that pagans, non-Christian, non-Jewish persons in the ancient world, particularly before Constantine, read Christian scripture. It has often been argued uh, among Christian scholars, and often generally assumed, really, that Christian literature's uh, primary readership was essentially other Christians, and that there wasn't really any kind of an avenue or expectation of books written by Christian for Christian purposes reaching a wider audience. Well, it's important to note that this isn't in the article or anything, but literature in the ancient world didn't circulate through Amazon.com. It didn't circulate through Barnes & Noble. Publishing in the ancient world basically looks like giving your friends copies of your books, reading your books in public, and we have evidence of book stalls. Augustine talks about picking up a Gospel of Thomas, maybe, in a book stall, and things like that. But most of the time, books travel through proximate social networks. Yeah, and there's a lot of reasons why uh, this happens. One is just the incredible difficulty of creating books in the ancient world. Uh, The materials on which books were written and printed were extremely expensive, and it was difficult to manufacture these. Another big part of this is the fact that most people in the ancient world couldn't read at all. Uh, Literacy rates are, um, you know, there's some variation in the way we've estimated it, but uh, William Harris has a classic study on literacy in the ancient world, and he argues that the literacy rate in in the Roman Empire couldn't have been more than about 10%. Right. So I, of course, start by pointing out that absolutely most pagans did not read Christian books. In fact, most pagans didn't read. Furthermore... Christianity before Constantine, for most of that period, is a tiny sect, and so most pagans would never encounter Christians. But on the other side of that, of being a tiny minority, it only takes a very small handful of pagans to read your books in order to give you the impression that you're getting a pagan readership. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, If if there's only a very few of you, um, you're not expecting the whole world to be reading your books. The other caveat to be given at the beginning is everyone admits that Celsus, Porphyry, Julian, uh, Hierocles read Christian scripture. This is not controversial. The argument, as presented by Norden and Harnack and McMullen, is that these are the only people who are reading Christian scripture. That is, people who, for some reason or other, have been upset by Christians and go and find their books and decide to read them in order to make fun of them and critique them on internal grounds and otherwise. So these are sort of being cordoned off. These are set aside. These are not controversial. The question is, did pagans other than this small group of irked intellectuals encounter Christian scripture and read it? So the passage that is often cited uh, from early Christian literature to justify this belief that pagans did not, for the most part, tend to find their way to Christian literature is a passage from Tertullian. This is what Harnack and McMullen and others have cited as evidence for this this case. Uh, here's Tertullian. Uh, Far less do people agree with our writings to which no one comes unless they are already a Christian. So here it seems like, at first glance, that Tertullian is saying that nobody will pick up a Christian write- text unless they already happen to be Christian. And this looks like a good piece of evidence. There are two problems with it, though. The first is that we are quoting this thing out of context. And if you go and look at the context, Tertullian, in the beginning of his treatise on the testimony of the soul, is saying that we don't need to use literature to make my case. We just need to look inwards at our soul. And to support this, he says, nobody reads Plato, nobody reads Aristotle, and by no means does anybody read our books. Instead, let's look at the nature of the human soul. 
So he's critiquing highfalutin intellectual <laughs> treatises. And so it's not entirely clear that what Tertullian has in mind here is actually scripture. In context, it seems more likely that he's saying nobody reads the works of Christian intellectuals. Furthermore, this is obviously a rhetorical construction. He is saying nobody in the world reads the classic books of intellectuals, which Tertullian, of course, knows isn't true. But I have to say this is still a pretty decent piece of evidence. There is, however, another passage from Tertullian which weighs in the opposite direction. So here's a, here's a quote from Tertullian's Apology. Therefore, you that think we do not care about the health of Caesar, look into the words of God, our books, which we do not hide, in which many occasions hand over to outsiders. Now, it's super, super common for apologists to say, read our books. You just need to look at our books and you'll know better. Um, this isn't the argument. Tertullian there is just picking up on a topos, accusing their opponents, who are probably not reading the, Tertullian's Apology anyways, of ignoring Christian scripture. The bit that's interesting is our books, which we do not hide, and which many occasions hand over to outsiders. Tertullian actually says that pagans on many occasions encounter Christian books, particularly the words of God, Christian scripture. In some, what we get from Tertullian is him saying, nobody reads the works of intellectuals, especially Christian intellectuals, but many occasions hand over books to outsiders. It's a mixed bag. I just think that either way, Tertullian shouldn't be treated as dispositive. We can look at other evidence to answer this question. Tertullian doesn't just settle the matter. Right. So that's the deconstructive part of Ian's argument, that Tertullian cannot be used as a positive case that pagans were not reading Christian scripture. But is th what's the more constructive evidence? Do we have evidence of pagans actually reading Christian texts? And what Ian will show us is <laughs> that they, in fact, do. Um, we do have this. This is a very weird recording. Thanks for humoring us, everyone. So I suggest we look at six autobiographical conversion accounts from before the time of Constantine. That is, six Christians before the early 4th century tell us themselves how they became Christians. And it's striking that four of these Christians explicitly say that what occasioned their conversion was running into Christian books. The other two give this stereotyped philosophical conversion narrative that shows up in Jewish and pagan literature, that they wander from city to city, and eventually they come to the true faith. This, of course, is a rhetorical construction itself, but what's interesting about these two is if you look at all the parallels to this very stylized, stereotyped conversion narrative, none of them give talk about books, whereas both of these two, Justin and Clement, emphasize the role of scripture in this otherwise stereotyped narrative. Let's just read through the four conversion narratives. Here's Tatian. I sought by myself how I could find the truth. Considering weighty matters by myself, I happened upon some barbaric writings. Theophilus of Antioch, therefore do not disbelieve, but believe. For I also disbelieved that this will happen. But having considered these things, now I believe. At that time, I also encountered the holy scriptures of the holy prophets, who also foretold the spirit of God, the things that have happened, just as they happened, and the things that now are, as they are happening, and the things in the future, in the order in which they will be completed. Therefore, acquiring proof of the things happening, even as predicted, I do not disbelieve, but obeying God, I believe. Mm -hmm. Just a note on that. Very clearly, the holy books of the prophets, he's referring to what we would call the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament. But this, he says, made him a Christian. Moreover, he says he acquired with these things proof of the things happening even as predicted. He received these, therefore, not as primarily Jewish books, but as, as books of Christian scripture. And to get proof of the things happening as predicted, and to believe that that refers to Jesus, these books must have been accompanied by either a Christian exegete, standing there and explaining these things to Theophilus, or perhaps other Christian books that explain these. So I'm not counting references to pagans encountering Jewish scripture. There's a lot of those. I'm, I'm counting pagans encountering Christian scripture, which includes the Septuagint when that is explicitly encountered as Christian scripture. Mm -hmm. 
So here's a commodian. I was wandering, walking ignorantly, taken by an empty hope. While the fervor of my youth carried me in the air, in being approached, I was given a book of the law. Learning what was there, at once a lamp was lit for me. Then truly I knew the supreme God in heaven, and therefore I urged such others to withdraw from error. Commodian also says, The beginning of our preface sets forward the way for our wanderers, and a good respite when one will come to the end of the age to become eternal, which ignorant hearts disbelieve. I similarly wandered for a long time, tending on temples, my parents themselves being ignorant. Finally, reading about the law brought me out from there. And I show that in the works of Commodian, the law does not refer to Jewish scripture, but to the message of the gospel, basically. Finally, this is a quote from Dionysius of Alexandria in response to the question of why he reads books by heretics. And this is the answer that he gets in a vision after praying about this matter. Uh, read everything that might come into your hands since you are able to navigate and examine everything. Indeed, this was the cause of your faith from the beginning. Right, so God's response to Dionysius is, you became a Christian by reading books you didn't agree with. Therefore, you have the ability to discern other works, so you're fine to keep re reading books by heretics. The final two, which I referred to earlier, are Justin and Clement, and we're not going to walk through these, we're going to keep moving. Mm -hmm. But Justin and Clement both tell this very stereotyped story, and yet both of their philosophical journeys culminate by running into a individual who finally enlightens them about the truth. And in both stories, um, Justin's story in the Dialogue of Trifo and Clement's story in the beginning of Stromata, the thing that characterizes this final individual is their mastery of scripture. And Justin even follows us up by saying something like, therefore, those who are seeking should look into our books because that's how they'll discover the truth. So, right, these are stereotyped and they're not just people randomly encountering books like the other four. But what sets these apart from the wider stereotype is the role books play in their conversion. Of course, you know, one of the things that we have to confront when we're dealing with this question of Christians recounting their own conversions and uh, recounting how they've come to the faith is how much of this actually is a reflection of reality? How much of this is... It should be understood as a genuine historical memory of how people became Christians and how much of it should just be understood as, um, as sort of a, an apologetically motivated idealization of the conversion process. That after intense study and examination, people just have no choice but to accept that this is clearly the truth. Paula Fredrickson has written some great work on conversion being a retelling of, pa of one's personal past in order to justify their present action. And that's I mean, explicitly <laughs> what Dionysius is doing, right? So my response to this is if we look at clearly fictional conversion narratives, if you look at apocryphal acts, the pseudo Clementine romances, or you look at the way apologists and others characterize conversion in the early church, um, if you look at how Winter Tertullian or Gregory or these people are talking about conversions, which probably have some basis in historical reality, but they're couching these rhetorically, none of these authors talk about the role books played. As far as we can tell, the ideal conversion, the ideal means of converting other people wasn't giving them a book. All this literature seems to credit particularly compelling missionaries and, more than anything else, miracles as instrumental in creating converts. Furthermore, the role books play for each of these four conversion narratives, Tatian, Theophilus, Commodian, and Dionysius, is significantly different. Dionysius mentions it in passing as justification for him continuing to read heretical books. Tatian mentions it to support the greater antiquity of Moses. This is not a simple trope that people are borrowing wholesale from previous Christian authors. It's something that they're introducing incidentally as part of larger arguments and different larger arguments. So I think the evidence actually weighs against this being a product of idealization. Mm -hmm. So we're going to go through the rest of the article fairly quickly. But an another thing that's worth talking about is why pagans might pick up these Christian scriptures in the first place. When pa when pagans do talk about having read Christian scriptures, a lot of times with it's with this sort of... Um, I don't know, anthropological interest, for lack of a better term, that they just, they, that these are readers who tend to be interested in barbarian religions and just want to know what they're all about and are kind of fascinated by it. Uh, this is the explanation that Porphyry gives uh, for having read these things, and, and same with Celsus. And Numenius and Amelius as well. Yeah, so this is answering an objection that 
Pagans didn't read Christian literature because Christian literature were embarrassingly badly written. And the apologists all concede this. Yeah, the Christian books are pretty badly written. But this actually seems to have furnished its appeal to certain pagan readers, yeah. particularly those we've mentioned. Yeah. People are particularly interested in foreign barbarian practices. And this is borne out not only in these known pagan readers of Christian scripture, but, you know, Tatian indicates the same thing. <laughs> Finally, given all the things we said earlier about book circulation, how on earth did pagans encounter these works? The argument moves in two pieces. First of all, there is in fact evidence of books circulating outside of immediate social networks, particularly philosophical and some religious literature that was designed to and seems to have, in fact, um, escaped the gravity of social networks um, and reached other people. So we find in Herculaneum, the one, one of only a handful of libraries that survives in situ, we find treatises there from opposing philosophical sects. And how did that happen? Well, we don't have a lot of evidence, but there does seem to be a few hints that Christians actively disseminated their literature. So here's a quote from Porphyry. At this time, many Christians and other, others put forth revelations of, and then a list of names that Porphyry would have considered to be barbaric, um, and by this deceived many themselves having been deceived. He says that Christians were uh, deceiving many people by uh, passing around these uh, strange revelations from all around the world. In a pseudo-Clementine letter on virginity, the unknown author says, On account of this, we do not sing to heathens and do not read to them. And skipping to the end, he says, Do not act in this way, my brothers. We ask, therefore, my brothers, these things should not happen among you, but remove those who choose to conduct themselves shamefully and wretchedly in this way. So this author says, don't read books to pagans, and if you find people doing it, you've got to kick them out. Uh, Tertullian also discusses other groups of Christians reading books to pagans and says this is a bad thing to do. So there's evidence that this, in fact, was done by some people. And finally, when we look at uh, Lucian's parody of uh, Christian missionary behavior, Peregrinus is in the jail. Uh, this is a description of what he gets up to. And the best of them, the Christians, even slept inside with him, having bribed the jailers. Moreover, providing many meals and reading their holy books. We here have Christians reading aloud in a public place. If you look at other descriptions, even within Lucian of jail cells, it is assumed that you have other people listening, watching, and present. So Lucian depicts Christians reading in public. And there are other examples. Kelsus talks about Christian priests exhibiting barbaric books and using books that have funny names in them. The point is, there is in fact some evidence, and almost all of it hostile, <laughs> um, <laughs> to Christians disseminating literature. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, Ian, where can we read this? This is now published in Vigili Christianae. Um, and if you don't have access to this and you'd like to read a copy... Send me an email at newtestamentreview at gmail.com. You can also get a hold of us on Twitter at newtreview. Thanks all for uh, sticking around. Thanks.